Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Gilbart. I'm a professor of sociology at BCC and a member of the Multicultural Committee that's sponsoring this event. And I'd like to welcome you. Um, we have an opportunity to hear a great speaker today. Uh, before we do, I just wanted to let you know that this is part of a program of activities that are going on throughout the semester. Um, there's actually an event happening tomorrow, which is a one-man show called The Life and Times of Paul Robeson in the Art Center over at the Fall River campus at 1230, uh, which would be very interesting if people are able to attend that. If you're not able to attend, but you can you can observe it here, it's going to be Skyped, uh, so it would be on a screen in room 216, which is upstairs. So if you're interested in attending uh, that, I think you'd learn a lot and it's very interesting. Um, so let me talk a little bit about today's speaker. Um, Tom Shapiro is a professor at Brandeis University. He's the director of the Institute on Assets and Social Policy. Um, back in um, the 1990s, um, early 1990s, Tom was engaged in research on the issue of black-white inequality in wealth and the impact that that has on economic opportunity. And he was a groundbreaker in that field, uh, wrote a couple of books that have had a major impact. One of them is The Hidden Cost of Being African American, How Wealth Perpetuates Inequality which was widely reviewed and recognized and received awards. And uh, not only is, has he done research on this, but he is working in that field to try to address this issue through the institute that he's the head of and through speaking into to various groups as is, is the case today. Tom also, by the way, used to be a professor at <laughs> Northeastern University and that's where I met him. I was a graduate student getting my PhD in Northeastern in the early 90s. He was on my dissertation committee, and if it hadn't been for him, I would not have done my PhD. <laughs> so thank you, Tom. <laughs> so um, we, we have about um, an hour and 10 minutes for this. Um, Tom will talk for a while. Um, if you have any questions, please keep them in mind, and there'll be a question and answer period at the end. And um, so let's uh, get started. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, please don't feel that you have to wait until the end if you um, are not getting something or I'm not saying it clearly enough. Um, raise your hand or, or shout it out and, and we'll be good. We'll be good. We first met Sandra in 1998 um, when she was living uh, in Charlestown, that sort of hard scrabble. Um, inner city part of our part of Boston where uh, several movies have been made uh, that usually uh, typify uh, gangsters and their uh, heroic iconic role in American society like the town um, and, and some other movies and that's the kind of community that she was living in and she was living with um, at that point with her five-year-old daughter Crystal when we talked to, to Sandra in 1998 uh, Crystal was running around the, the living room. And she was running around playing with a toy medical kit. She had that plastic stethoscope around her neck and she was you know, listening to the walls and doing this and that. Um, and when we asked Sandra about what her ambitions were for her daughter, Crystal, she said, well, it's really clear she wants to be a doctor. And that she's always been engaged with, with science and medical stuff. All right. Sandra's raising Crystal as a single mom. Um, she is engaged to a, to a veteran at that point in time. And she is flirting with the poverty line in the United States. Um, she's working helping the less abled in her community, which doesn't pay much and is not real steady work. Um, so she's clearly part of that 47% that doesn't pay any taxes, doesn't make enough money to do that. Um, but she's doing the best she can for herself and her, her young daughter at that time. How's Crystal going to get to medical school? How's Crystal going to be a doctor? Well, Sandra actually has tried to think that through pretty clearly. And on her poverty level income, she starts saving some money. She starts being very frugal and has a target of putting in the bank to a dedicated, in her mind, her mental mind, a dedicated account for Crystal's college. And she starts putting $100 a month aside, which for somebody earning about $20,000, 
um, is a much higher savings rate than the wealthy, by the way. Um, she's really having to sacrifice to do that. She had accumulated about $2,000 in savings when we talked to her in 1998. And when we talked to her about um, her debts, did she owe anything? She had this amazing attitude about credit cards. She said, no, I, I can't have, I don't have credit cards because I don't want to owe anybody anything. Right now, do you know people that say that today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't have credit cards? Yeah. But maybe after the Great Recession, some people might think, think like that. Um, but it's an amazing kind of attitude to think about uh, somebody thinking like that and not just thinking, behaving and acting like that uh, 14 years ago when they don't have enough money, when they don't have enough resources themselves. Like we did with nearly 200 other families um, like Sandra, we had the opportunity to talk to them again um, a, year, uh, a year and a year and a half ago. So we caught up with Sandra in May of 2011. She's now living in Dorchester, um, another inner city community, uh, part of metropolitan Boston. Um, and her life has not exactly gone the way she envisioned it, the way she was planning it for either herself or her daughter. Her work, still working with the less abled in, in, in her community, helping them to get to the grocery store, buying things, helping them being that, that kind of that kind of vital aid and that kind of vital link. She still did that kind of work, but it was less often. It was less frequent. Her income wasn't as good. Um, Crystal had had an accident where um, temporarily she was disabled and had to drop out of high school. So she was off track. And she also was not in an academic track. Sometimes as a parent, um, and you think about what your five-year-old might be like in your own mind, but maybe that's not what the five-year-old really is going to be able to do. That may not be their own capacity. So that medical thing was off track, clearly off track. And it would take um, quite a series of extraordinary events to make that happen again for her. Her partner that she was engaged to, that veteran, had passed away. Um, I want to talk about the circumstances that, we, that she thought it was, was related to, to, some, to some injury and some conditions that he actually had, had gotten while he was in the military. Um, but that was, that was sort of unclear and just in her mind. Um, when he passed, there was not enough money to pay for a proper burial for him. The military paid only a certain amount, but not the kind of burial that she wanted for her, for her partner. So she put down about $900, um, wiping out a lot of her savings at that point in time. So that when we talked to her in May of 2011, there were zero dollars in her savings account. And her attitude about credit cards had changed out of necessity. She was having to make ends meet by essentially borrowing money at the end of the month and putting groceries and other things on a credit card and electric bills heating bills, gas bills, things like that. She now had $2,500 in debt on high interest credit cards. She was still hopeful that her daughter, Crystal, would have some career in, in medicine. But now it was not as a doctor. She was thinking maybe she could get into nursing school. Right. So what's happened here? One family. But I think the, the story, the lived experience of that family tells us a lot about what has happened to families like that in the past 15 to 20 years in American society, especially families like, like Sandra and young Crystal at that point in time. What I want to focus on and what I want to spend the next hour or so is, is I want to throw out a question and I'm going to pose a a bunch of data and a bunch of not all that many facts, but, uh, but enough facts to point us to an answer to that question. And the que I want to treat the question as not closed, but open to hear different, different sets of ideas, different views, different interpretations. And that's where I would really love to engage in a dialogue about that. So the question I want to pose is in post-Civil Rights America, that is, post-1960s, 
where there was an incredible change in the legal structure and customs, if you will, around the legality of African Americans and others to be able to buy homes, to get credit at a, a fair and equitable rate like everybody else, to eat in restaurants, to go to colleges, to go to universities, all of those things that we, for the most part, take for granted today. All right. That's what I mean by a post-civil rights at a legal level and reflected somewhat in custom as well. All right. What's happened with the state of racial inequality in the United States? And I want to think of it maybe somewhat narrowly. I'm going to think of it in economic or material terms. All right. So. Um, I want to suggest that, um, uh, maybe I won't mess up your, your bulletin board, it looks too white at the moment. Um, <laughs> but I want to suggest that um, in the United States, when we think about equality, we tend to have um, a two-box model, if you will. I will mess it up. Um, we have a, a box that um, many people call opportunity. I'll just, just leave it like that for the, minute, for the moment. Opportunity. Um, in the civil, prior to, to the 1960s and still today, a lot of our concern about justice and equity and fairness is what I would call targeted for the opportunity box. That is, we ask the question, is opportunity really equal? Are our institutions providing equal enough access to education, to jobs, to income, to housing, to shelter, et cetera? And where we think that's not the case, we try and change those laws if we think the inequity is egregious enough. And I want to suggest that um, in what I would term the unfortunate framing, the phraseology of affirmative action is exactly aimed at what I would call that opportunity box. It is about equalizing opportunity. All right. Now the theory often stops there. For many people, um, liberals and conservatives, it seems to me that opportunity seems to be enough, equalizing it. But I want to suggest that that box is meant to lead to something else. It's meant to lead to achievement. The assumption being that human beings, in fact, do have some differences, <laughs> um, minor differences in intelligence, differences in um, willingness to work hard, character, ability, behavior, and that's going to reflect itself in different levels of achievement. The variation, the degrees of, of difference aren't all that great. But there is going to be some, some variation that occurs there. Uh, and it's not going to be linked or connected to race, class, ethnicity, or gender. The factors are, are, are a lot more uh, subtle than that. And then the box we never talk about in the United States <laughs> is we never ask the question, which is the question I've been trying to pose and get on the public and academic agenda. The question is, um, among those that have equal achievement, it should be the case that the reward or the outcome is also relatively equal, right? People with college degrees should have roughly the same income band, the same job band, etc. Right? People with the same amount of income should be able to buy the same in the same suburb or the same house or have the same rent, whatever it is. I'm going to suggest this is far from the case. And at the end of the, of the hour here, um, I really want to push our thinking about um, how one thinks about equity, how one thinks about justice, how one thinks about opportunity and achievement in the United States. All right, so let's go back to the data. 
or let's get to some of the data. Traditionally in the United States, by traditionally I mean ever since the data has been collected, almost ever since the Census Bureau was founded, when you wanted to measure a yardstick, how do we know what economic racial inequality looks like in the United States? Right. Instead of having a, a talk radio argument where whoever yells the loudest, whoever controls the microphone wins, now let's actually find some facts. Let's actually get some data and see what that data, what's the story that that information tells us. So typically what we have looked at is a measure of the income of whites versus the income of African Americans. Median family income, median is half above, half below. It's a good measure of typical or average, if you will. And as a ratio, you can look at that. We can look at it over time. So from about the mid, not about, from the mid-1960s to today, that benchmark, that yardstick, measuring average median family income, white to black, has ranged from about 61 cents on a dollar. That is, the average African American family earns 61 cents for every dollar of income the average white family earns. That's the high point. The low point is about 54 cents on the dollar. Now, if you think about it a little bit with me, um, from the mid-1960s to today is a, a relatively long period of time. Right. But the band, 61 cents, 54 cents on a dollar, that's a pretty narrow band. So as a sociologist, you know, we're thinking, well, maybe there's a structure, maybe there's a pattern there. Maybe that's not random. Maybe that's something that's embedded in American society somehow, and we'll get to that somehow. But the data is really clear. The data, by the way, comes from tax returns. Uh, it comes from the Census Bureau. It comes from the Department of Treasury. We get that data every single year. Right. So we can actually look at the, at, you can look at the curve. You can look at the pattern. You can have celebrations or you can pull whatever hair is left out of your, your, your head trying to figure out what, what happened. Was it policy? Was it the economy? Was it this or that? All right. So our standard benchmark then of economic racial, black-white inequality. Um, and we can you know, fold in questions as we go along about what does this look like for Latinos, Cape Verdeans, um, Asian Americans, whomever, as we go along. I'll be happy to try and answer those as, as we get there. Um, we've got that band, about 60, between 61 and 54 cents on the dollar. All right. And we've taken that as the standard. All right. Now let's think about that. That tells us that if the goal is some kind of justice, some kind of parity, we have to think about how do we get from 61 cents on a dollar to something close to 99, 100, depending upon what your standard is, and we're going to differ about that. But you want to move that needle, right? So you want to look at what's, what's the gap, what's the makeup between 61 and something close to 98, 99, 100, right? Let's flip a switch. Because income tells us only part of the story. A good part of the story, an important part of the story, but that story doesn't have many chapters to it. Right. And what I and a bunch of colleagues have been filling in that story with is to look at, uh, at family assets and liabilities, wealth that a family has. So let's backtrack half a second and talk about the difference between income and wealth. Income is what people get from a job or the substitute for a job. Unemployment insurance, social security, disability, pension, whatever. Right. So in, think of income as a, as a stream, excuse my metaphors here, as a stream that runs, um, on, uh, you can see it on the top of the ground. It comes into your house and most American families use all of that income on survival needs. We use it to pay our rent. We buy food. We buy clothes. Hopefully there's a little something left over at the end of the month for that extra movie, that, that meal out that's a little more than we think what the budget can really afford. Um, 
and we try to maybe put a little of that in savings. But most American families have not been able to do that. So that's that income stream. Wealth, think of as a reservoir. It's a big safety deposit box in the ground where we store resources. Stocks, bonds, savings accounts, individual retirement accounts, the money, the amount of your home that you can sell for more than what you bought it for, home equity. That's wealth. Now, why does that matter? And I won't go into why that's been, social science has left that out of the picture, and historians have left that out of the picture for way too long. But why does wealth matter? All right. Most families, as I, as I said, use income um, basically to re reproduce their daily lives. They use it for daily living expenses. When we think about what gets families ahead, what helps to pay for college, what helps to buy a home? What helps to buy a home in a, in a safer community? What helps to put your family in a community that's got a higher quality school system? What helps to start a business? What's needed for retirement? That's not income. That's wealth. That's that storehouse of resources. That's, you know, that's what Romney's got a lot of. <laughs> All right. That's wealth. That gets your kids into private schools. That allows you to navigate poor public schools. It allows you to do all kinds of things. All right. Wealth is not just used, not just important for those moving ahead ideas, but wealth is also important as an emergency and, and for contingencies. All right. We live in the Northeast. What happens in the winter if you have a car? We've got potholes. Uh, you go over one, you break an axle. <laughs> You're, you bust a tire. Um, you can't just say, give me a tire, break, you know, fix my car. You're out 900 bucks. Or you're out 100 bucks a tire. All right. A lot of people don't have that, can't pay for that out of your, in, out of your, your job check, most people. Um, You've either got, in these days, put it on a credit card, which means you've created a debt for yourself, or you dip into a, an emergency savings account. Right. That's what wealth does. It's that contingency emergency, and it's that moving ahead money. All right. So when we flip the lens to now look at, all right, we know that income band is 61 to 54 cents on a dollar. What is it with wealth in the United States? All right. now, let me keep the drama hanging before I give you any data first. All right. So um, income is something that almost exclusively it taps a contemporary set of skills that people have. There's no history to it. It's just about what your labor is valued at in the workplace. So it shouldn't matter in some ways what your gender is, what the color of your skin is, what your sexual preference, what your age, and none of that stuff should matter. Right. Wealth has the capacity of opening a window to the past. Because unlike income, for example, wealth can be passed along. Inheritance is the, the crudest example. Okay. Um, a family, if you're fortunate enough, <laughs> and they have that kind of generosity involved, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whomever, um, before they pass and after they pass away, have the capacity to pass money, pass wealth along to um, their loved ones. It's unearned in the sense that we think about earnings. All right. Some people might pervert that and talk about how they've earned it, but I'll, I'll talk about those <laughs> kinds of interviews. It's actually very interesting. Um, wealth has that capacity. Right. It cracks open that window to the past. Now, when we do that, we get to bring historical legacy into this picture about black, white, in particular, wealth gap, and black, white economic differences in particular. 
up until relatively recently in historical times, what, African Americans couldn't own property, they were property? I don't think I need to go through the entire litany. They weren't allowed to own homes, they weren't allowed to own businesses, um, putting money in banks was a very risky venture. All, right. All of that at, it varies by state until it's nationally outlawed, if you will, in, in the 1960s. All right. So the capacity to build wealth in past generations is conditioned by the circumstances, the laws, the level, the state of inequality and justice in a society. Now, let me, let me bang this home <laughs> with one example. Um, uh, and I do this because a lot of, um, myself included, a lot, of, um, a lot of young people, a lot of young adults in particular, um, um, have, have an attitude that, um, what does history matter? It's something in the past, um, which, it w which it is. But what's the relevance of it for the present? And what's the relevance, if any, for the future? All right, so let me give a quick example. Um, Post-World War II America, 1950s. Um, some of the, uh, if you will, that's when uh, suburban America was built uh, with, a, with a lot of federal infrastructure that allowed that to happen. Um, federally backed loans uh, through the Veterans Administration, the GI Bill of Rights, Levittown, New York is the classic American suburb. Doesn't exist before World War II. Is built entirely post-World War II America. Homes could be bought there uh, for about, in, in prices those days, about $25,000. Right? Um, but African Americans were not allowed to buy in Levittown. There literally was a codicil, a line on the title that said, you can't sell your house to X, Y, and Z. And it wasn't just African Americans. Levittown included Catholics, Native Americans. A whole, the list was long. Right. Today, a house in Levittown, if it was kept up, sells for about $300,000, $350,000. So that difference between the 25, I will account for inflation. Let's not do that calculation at the minute, the moment. Between the 25 and 350 is wealth. Wealth produced not out of working or a job, but wealth produced out of institutional dynamics, out of home ownership. An opportunity that was systematically denied to African Americans. Okay. Okay. Happened. Not just Levittown, but the hundreds of Levittowns like it, those su suburbs that started after World War II in the United States. If we fast forward, Let's do a hypothetical example today. Um, your, my grandfather bought a home in Levittown. Um, he retired to Florida. He cashed out that equity. Um, he passed away. Um, and now he's left my brother and I. He skipped over um, his one son. And he's gone right to the grandchildren. And um, he's left me $100,000. This is hypothetical, guys. <laughs> He's left me $100,000. All right. Um, I now, um, with my uh, young partner, want to go buy a house in Boston where the prices are exorbitant. And we're thinking of having a family. Um, and I don't want my kid in the wretched Boston public school system. So I got to look at a house in Newton, in Brookline, um, in Weston, in Wellesley, this is hi all hypothetical guys. I actually live in Jamaica Plain, <laughs> right, in this, right in the city. <laughs> um, I've got $100,000. I find a house, I take that $100,000 and I take it to the mortgage broker and say, this is my down payment. I get a lower interest rate. The loan I get is lower because I don't need to borrow as much. I become invested in a great community. My kid gets to go to a, uh, have the opportunity of going to high quality schools. All of those advantages. Did I earn that? I'm lucky. 
and all those that, that are in a similar situation are, are similarly very lucky. But my point of this um, hypothetical story that I could tell in real terms for the people we've interviewed, and I'll get to that, the point of this story is that something in the past, not in very distant past, not even slavery, not even Jim Crow, right? 1950s, America, right? The opportunity to buy in Levittown has a difference in my present. It allows me to live in a, a, a neighborhood that my income can't afford me to put me in, to have my kids in a school system that I couldn't afford to, to buy them access to, to be in a network, the peers around me, um, that's probably, quote, in job terms, higher than what I otherwise could afford to be around. Right. All those networks are very different. Sort of my, my class or my status has been jumped <laughs> artificially by the wealth that was passed along to me. So that's the present. But it spends itself out into the future. It's a mortgage that's much lower. It's home equity. The amount of wealth I'm going to build in that home is going to rise more than if I'd been able to buy elsewhere. My kids are going to go to a school, um, a higher quality school, maybe a prep school, because I can afford that now. All right. So the historical act of systematic discrimination, of the conditions under which some groups could accumulate wealth and others couldn't, from at a point in our history, has very clear ramifications, both in the present and in the future. That's my long about way <laughs> of talking about why wealth is so important to look at when we think about the question of economic inequality between any groups in American society. All right, so now, now the data. Um, the average African, when you compare median wealth Af average African-American family to median wealth of white family, the difference is 10 to 1. All right, and let me tell you that a different way. For every dollar of wealth that the average white family has, the average African-American family has a dime. Now, most white families don't have very much wealth at all. And I want to be, let's be really clear about that. In fact, about 25% um, have virtually no wealth. So we're not talking about, when I say average, I mean that we understand there's a great variation. So in sociological terms, the issues, the, the theoretical axes of discrimination and inequality we need to look at include both race, race ethnicity, and class. Because it's, you can see that kind of, of, over, of overlay in the examples that I've just given. All right, so now let's think about our challenge and our problematic. The issue of equity and justice is no longer how do we get our minds around going from 60 cents on a dollar to something close to a dollar on a dollar, but think about how that project now is first, oh my gosh, how did we get to a situation where African Americans have a dime for every dollar of wealth that whites have? And how do you close that gap? How do you even, what is equity in that situation? And it's, it's, a, it's a huge and a tremendous challenge. Okay. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and tell you um, about a couple of studies that we're involved in and, and why, we're, why we're doing them. So the data I just gave about a dime on a dollar <coughs> comes from um, what, are, what are nationally representative, that is, they're good samples um, of the United States population. Every group is involved in, in, the, in the sampling frame. It's a good representation of, um, of wealth inequality in the United States. Um, but that only tells us, tells us something very important. It tells us what that dynamic is, but it only captures it at one point in time. Right. It's what we call a cross-sectional sample. So when that study and, and 
there are three or four different databases. I don't want to get into that unless you really raise the question about it. I don't want to get too wonky. Um, those studies, uh, those surveys are done about every other year. So you can look at the data from 2008 and you can look at it from 2010. But the samples are representative, but they're not the same families. You don't follow, that data doesn't follow the same set of families from, 19, from 2008 to 2010. Right. So I wanted, I thought it was really important, critically important, to get to information that follows the same set of families over some period of time so that we can look at what are the institutional dynamics, what are the contemporary persistent institutional dynamics that close the racial wealth gap, that keep it the same, or that widen it? Because it's an open question. We go into this, we really don't know. We really don't know. Right. So to get that kind of data, we use um, using uh, data from a study where we can follow, we have followed families from 1984 to the present day. Now, quickly, this is, not this is not necessarily a random representative sample of the United States population. It might have been in 1984, but people die, families break up, families merge, children go off on their own. It's no longer representative today. But it does tell us a lot about what happens to families and in this instance, we can think of African-American and white families when they go through school systems, when they go through communities, when they go through work, when they go through the same set of policies in the United States. What happens to that racial wealth gap? All right, now, so that's, that's one source of information, prime source of information that, that we use in our work. And I'm about to present some of that data to you. Um, that's what we call survey data. They're sort of standard questions, pretty thorough, pretty good. Um, pr I think, you know, as a social scientist, it's pretty reliable. I have a lot of confidence, a lot of faith in it. But that kind of data doesn't tell us why people do what they do. It's hard to get an interpretation, an explanation to understand the hows and the whys. It tells us the what. It tells us that people moved. It doesn't tell us why they moved. It tells us the neighborhood they moved to. It doesn't tell us why they moved to that neighborhood. Right. So we put in the field um, the interviews with Sandra and 200 families like her. In 1998, 1999, we interviewed nearly 200 families uh, clustered in three cities in the United States. Um, half white, half black, half um, uh, definably urban, half uh, suburban, um, about half middle class income and above, the other half um, working class, uh, low and moderate income families. All right, so we wanted, we wanted those kinds of, of, um, of stories to be able to tell that kind of data. We had the great opportunity, it's expensive research. <laughs> really expensive research. We had the great opportunity to follow them up and we have now re-interviewed more than 85 percent of those families. And at some point in time, that's going to be the next book <laughs> at some point. Um, it's a lot of work. We've got a lot of people looking at it. All right. In 1984, uh, the racial wealth gap in the large study that we didn't do, it's got like 3,000 families in it the one that followed families, that now has followed families for, for 25 years. 1984, the racial wealth gap was $85,000. And again, median um, wealth of white family, median wealth of African American family in that study. The gap between them, it was 90,000 to 5,500. So the gap was, was $85,000. Right. Um, 
we are about to release a report uh, next month that updates that. Uh, we've done one update already that updates it to the latest data. The data is from 2009. So now we're looking at the same set of families over 25 years. All right. Um, the history has already happened. <laughs> the history in that legacy is still important and is still probably spinning itself out. But I want to suggest that the emphasis I'm going to talk about is really on the consequences of American institutions and how they're experienced differently um, in this instance by race. All right. Quickly, um, the gap today in Inflation control dollars, the dollars are, are, are the same. They buy the, that what would buy the same amount in 1984, buys the same amount in 2009. So there's no trick with inflation here. The gap today is $151,000. So the gap goes from $85,000 um, to nearly tripling it, two and a half times, to $151,000. Uh, just quickly, the typical white family has $236,000 in wealth. The average African-American family, $28,500. So the gap is about 151,000. All right, so wealth went up for both over the 25 years. Um, but that gap has really stunningly widened over the period of time, over the period of the 25 years. Um, and work we've been doing, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's interesting work we do at the Institute, um, in terms of really now sort of trying to dig down in the question, what explains the increase, the $151,000 question, I call it, what explains the increase in the racial wealth gap between whites and blacks? Right. And our analysis points to um, four institutional areas. First, by far the largest in the data we're looking at, by far the largest, is home ownership. The number of years that a family has owned the home, the communities that those homes are located in, and the terms under which they bought their homes combined to explain about 42 percent of that increase, which in social science terms, when when one institutional factor, a complex one to be sure, explains that large of the gap, 42 percent, it's somewhat extraordinary. <laughs> I'll just throw that out to you for your consideration. Um, second, and I, I'm going to loop back to these in a moment. Second, income. And the income one is, is really interesting in terms of what the data told us. What we looked at in terms of income was um, gain in income over the 25 years. Not just the income that families had, but we were interested in seeing what difference increases of income made in, in wealth. So every dollar of income gain over 1984 to 2009 for whites, every dollar of income gain translated into $5 of wealth. Now, that's really cool. That's really good. <laughs> it shows how important income is. All right. One dollar gain in income translates for whites over the 25 years. All right, so I've got some accumulation going on here to five dollars of wealth. All right. For African Americans, the dynamic is very different. Gains in income also return gains in wealth. So yes, at a very sort of cloud-high, 30,000-foot level, uh, the system is doing what it's supposed to do. But look at the difference. For every dollar gain in income over the 25-year period for African Americans, the wealth gain was 70 cents. Right. So work unemployment, job training, promotion, the wage itself, benefits, retirement, the complex system around work um, still 
yields for the same achievement yields a very different outcome. So one of the things I'm going to suggest, um, I hope it's provocative, maybe it's common sense at this point, um, is that when we think about and talk about um, equity, fairness, justice, we need to keep this in mind. Absolutely. That's our sort of historical tradition in the United States. But we also have to look at outcomes. From equal, relatively equal achievement, are the rewards, is the wealth reward in this instance also relatively equal? And if it's not, we've got to really got to push and ask why. All right. Besides income and unemployment, the, the next, which is a good one for people in this class, um, the next most important factor was college education. Right. College education has large wealth returns for everybody. But again, it had differences for whites and blacks. It returned much more wealth over the 25 years to that typical white family than the typical African American family. And then um, lastly, the last one I want to talk about today is inheritance. And by inheritance we mean, again, not only what the money people receive when a friend or a loved one or a family member or kin passes, but also that money that's called in vivo transfer. The money that's passed along from a living person to another living person. Other than death, the one moment that triggers the most transfer of wealth from one generation to another is when a young couple buys their first home. Without a question. When a young couple buys their first home, typically if the families can afford it, they get a generous loan, loan, quote, keep that in quotes, <laughs> to buy, to help them buy that home. That's a transfer of wealth. And again, think about um, who can afford that, who can afford a larger loan, how the ramifications of that for the, the kind and location of the home that, that people have. Um, now I say keep that in mind for the following reason. In the set of interviews we did with live families, <laughs> where we re-interviewed them first in 98 and then we re-interviewed re them a year and, and two years ago, every single white and black homeowner received financial assistance from their families to buy their homes. Every single one. Now a lot of those had, had bought homes in the late 1990s or the early 2000s where the Housing markets were a lot hotter than they are today, and it was very, very difficult to buy a home just out of earnings. You needed some kind of financial support, and larger representative data uphold that. The stories of the 200 families we talked to were not extraordinary in that way. Now, it also was interesting to us, and still is interesting to us, to look at the different ways that families typically help each other. So typically for, uh, for white families, um, typically it was money. Typically it was cash. Um, I'm, I, I blank now, but I, I forget the, the woman's name. The husband and wife we interviewed in St. Louis, who um, also had, uh, when we first interviewed families, they all had to have kids about four or five or six because we wanted them thinking about school choices housing choices, et cetera, as their families were, were growing and space needs were changing and educational needs had to be, had to be met. Um, a young family in St. Louis, is, uh, St. Louis, they wanted to move to a suburb. And uh, they both worked um, at moderately paying jobs. <coughs> um, they were above the poverty line. They weren't in poverty. Uh, it was a, a sort of a solid St. Louis working class family. Drinking Budweiser and all that. That's where the Bud plan is, by the way. <laughs> One of the highlights of a tour in St. Louis. Um, they start to hold garage sales every Sunday all right, to accumulate money to buy that house. All right, and they kept doing that and doing that. And the story they told when we asked them, how did you buy the house you're in? The story they told 
was that her mother was over for dinner one night and was asking questions about where is the child going to go to school, how are the garage sales going, and the, the, the young couple start to talk about you know, the garage sales and they're, you know, they're, they're fun and successful, but it's not raising a whole lot of money. I mean, who wants my old beach umbrella? <laughs> and how much are they going to pay for it? <laughs> All right. The mother, the grandmother to the child, literally said, this is ridiculous. Opens her purse and writes a check for $30,000. Here's your down payment. Now, don't we all wish we had a grandma like that? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we do. And I wish everybody did, but not everybody does. <laughs> and that's the point. Later, much later, in that same interview with the same couple, when the set of questions turned to, um, we asked them about their assets. You know, do you want a bank account, a, a, an individual retirement account, a CD, a stock, whatever. We, we do an inventory and then we ask them, tell us the story about how you got that. How did you acquire that? And when we, when we got to the home, they told us that their down payment was out of their own earnings. It was a mind flip. The Jedi mind trick had happened. Um, they conveniently forgot that it was a $30,000 check that they had just told us about. And they flipped the American ideology into one of deservingness. They explained their unearned inheritance in a sense of deservingness. So when they were pushed, and the interviewer was really good about this, when they were pushed, um, the, the young wife eventually said, we earned it. We earned it because we held the garage sales. We deserved it. Okay. Think about how they've just translated that unearned inheritance into a sense of deservedness. Okay. Now, Lots of families hold garage sales <laughs> and do all kinds of things and are as deserving as that very fortunate family in St. Louis. But what's different is the grandma. What's different is a $30,000 check. All right, now that's what we call an in vivo transfer, which is a part of inheritance that gets passed along. Now, a parallel story, um, just because I think it's, it's sort of interesting to tease this out a, a bit more. Um, Often, those kinds of checks that are written, now it may not be the spur of the moment at the dinner table, believe me, <laughs> um, are termed as loans. Right. So what happens when we then in the interview ask people, um, have you started to pay that loan back? <laughs> How much is remaining? <laughs> is there a payment schedule? Nah. No, it's, it's, a it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful, convenient fiction between um, parent and adult child that's, uh, that basically says, we can't give you the money. <laughs> and for the adult child is to say, we can't ask you for the money, but we can, we can ask for a loan. We can give them a loan. And then over time, that, that, gets, that gets forgotten. It gets forgiven. It becomes part of, part of the living inheritance. Okay. So let me, I could talk forever, I won't. <laughs> let me wind this up and open it up for, for a conversation with one which is for me a really critical point. And the critical point I want to make is that um, government policy, United States government policy has actively supported and invested in building wealth for American families going back generations. But we don't think of it because we have historical amnesia in the United <laughs> States. So if you don't know, you know, I'm going to throw out a few things you can, you can look at them in greater depth or raise them with, with Dan and say, is that guy really, how crazy is this guy? Um, the Homestead Acts, 
just before and just after the Civil War. The Homestead Acts, the federal and state governments gave land to people who could prove that they could build, sh that they built a shelter on it and that they could earn a living off of it. They just didn't hand land away. You, ser seriously, you, ha you had to prove that you built a shelter that you could live in and that you could earn a living. So you could, it could be agricultural land, it could be cattle, it could be livestock, it could be mining, it could be anything that earned a living off of that land. And then you got the title. Um, a colleague has traced home-owning property ship of American families back to the Homestead Acts, and she estimates that about 25% of current homeowners trace their property ownership back to the Homestead Acts. Oh. Now, I always thought that figure was way too high, but she keeps replicating it, and other researchers <laughs> replicate it as well. All right. Um, I was, I was, uh, land taken from Native Americans <laughs> in many instances to begin with, <laughs> redistributed um, mostly to white families. It, it, the story is, the historical story is intriguing. It differs a little bit by state, but by and large, um, um, the good land, if land was available to anybody other than whites, the good land was just available for whites. Swamp land in Mississippi, yeah, is available. Uh, but there's some interesting stories around islands off South Carolina that where there's still pockets of African American ownership that come from the Homestead Acts. But that's that's all right. Homestead Acts, property, homesteads, um, land grant colleges, American government investing in building wealth for families, the GI Bill of Rights, the Veterans Administration, guaranteeing banks that if they lend money to veterans buying homes after World War II, that the banks will be held harmless. Okay. Now those are, those are all in the way past, right? <laughs> yeah, but we see the windows. Last example, not the past. What I call the wealth budget of the United States government. Now in some sense, luckily, we're in a, the silly electoral season. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, conversation, if you can get through the noise, about tax policy. The wealth, government, the wealth budget of the United States government are incentives built into the tax code that allow people not to pay taxes if you do things we want you to do. So the biggest one, let's get to a couple of examples, the biggest one is home ownership. If you are a homeowner, you can take off of your taxes the interest that you pay on your mortgage. So the bigger your home, the fancier your home, the more you take off. The wealthier you are, the, the tax rate that you get, you, that tax it's subsidy, um, it's figuratively as if the U.S. government writes you a check to subsidize your home ownership. Okay. That's by far the largest one. Um, similarly, for putting money aside for retirement, that's tax sheltered. Um, I work at a university, uh, mandatorily there's money taken out of my paycheck, but it's not taxed. It'll be taxed when I draw it out when I'm retired, where presumably my tax rate will be a lot lower. The U.S. government, figuratively again, is writing me a check because I'm doing what it wants to do. They want me to do save for my retirement buy a house. And they're, they're things like that. All of that wealth building for individuals and families, not corporations. That's a different story. All right. We're gonna keep our eyes on, on families and individuals. Amount to about $400 billion a year. And that's not what we call a one-off. That's every single year gets repeated. All right. Now, conceptually, I can make the case that incentivizing home ownership and retirement security and business development for families is really good policy until we look at what the distribution of it is. Who takes advantage of those opportunities? So of that 400 billion, the top 1% receives about 60% of those benefits. And if I can use the oxymoron of bottom 60%, 
60% is not the bottom of anything, it's a majority, <laughs> receives 3%. All of those things help to exacerbate, to widen that racial wealth gap. Okay, um, let me stop. And I, you know, I get wound up sometimes and probably throw too much or too little at folks. I'm not quite sure all the time. Um, but let's open it up for, for questions, comments, um, in differences around interpretation, etc. Do you still have your question or did I? You answered it. I, I got to it. I anticipated. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. What was the impact of the housing debacle on African Americans? So the question is huh? the the question is what is the what was is the impact of the foreclosure crisis, the housing debacle on the wealth of different communities? There's a great report put out by the Pew Research Foundation. Um, that asked that question and answered it. Um, and let's see if I can remember. I'm going to come really close. Um, you know, yeah, I guess you don't allow people to have laptops in the room. They could look it up. Uh, but they could look it up. Um, there was a great wealth loss for everybody. Um, in the white community, the wealth loss, and it covered the period, I think, 2007 to 2009. I think it was the, it's the beginning of the Great Recession and when it was officially over. It's not officially over for families we're concerned about, but the bankers tell us and the Fed Reserve tell us it's over. Um, white communities' loss of wealth was about 27 percent, by far most of which was in a combination of um, home equity, the housing prices declined, and stock market. Um, Hispanic community, 61% wealth loss. Just incredible in a very short period of time. Much larger in percentage or ratio terms than whites because most of the wealth in Hispanic community is concentrated in homes. So as the housing market collapsed, um, as that house of cards fell apart, um, it impacted much more greatly on the Hispanic community in, in ratio terms than in the white community. Although the loss in the white community was great. All right, again, race, class, overlay, think about that. African American community, the wealth loss was 54%. 64? 54. 54 percent. And again, um, mostly concentrated in, uh, in uh, declining home value prices. All right, so. Um, incredibly discouraging, especially for those of us that um, have been involved, um, not just on the academic side, but trying uh, in advocacy, in working with constituencies, with working with grassroots organizations, in dealing with the media, in dealing with policy people, local, state, and federal levels, and actually getting good legislation passed to see the good work that it took more than 10 years to do, killed overnight um, because of the financial crisis and the, and the foreclosure crisis in particular. Um, I'm still, not still, I continue to be integrally involved in um, organizing an advocacy around um, racial justice, specifically in closing the racial wealth gap. I work with a set of, um, of organizations around a init national initiative called Closing the Racial Wealth Gap. Um, if people are interested, you can go to uh, the insight, I-N-S-I-G-H-T dot org, which is um, a community development and CDFI organization based in Oakland, California that manages this initiative. And there's a whole part of their website around Closing the Racial Wealth Gap initiative um, where you get to um, uh, experts of color, we get to all the partners, um, and you can sort of see some of the reports that are issued around that. Um, other questions? Yes. Good, please. I can definitely understand the whole gap in between. Uh, my daughter's, uh, she's in high school, just in the year. 
she goes to Bristol Aggie, so a lot of her friends are out in the suburbs, mm -hmm. and she's always wondering, why can't we live out there? And I'm like, well, we can't afford to live out there. But her friends, like, they, their land was inherited to them. They got acres. Um, their grandparents left them money. So they're living there not because they could afford it, but because they got the land inherited to them. You know, so we don't have that kind of money. So we're still stuck down here. That's right. That, that's part of the, that historical legacy. It, it's part of, um, you know, I've not come up with, with what for me is an adequate enough metaphor yet. The metaphor, the traditional metaphor we use is that um, different groups have different starting points in the race, right? And that's an indication of that. You know, different starting point. You start off with a different wealth level that has nothing to do with your own achievement. It has to do with uh, the fortune of whom your family is and what they bring into that, that structure. Um, but what I'm also talking about in terms of, of do equal outcomes, relatively equal outcomes come from equal achievements, um, it's as if, um, you know, uh, you, we take a test as a student and a, a 90 qualifies for an A minus if you're white. Um, a 90 qualifies for a C plus if you're African American. I mean, that, that's the analogy, it seems to me. Similar achievement <laughs> results in different wealth. Right. And that has to do with the, the very deeply embedded, enduring um, <coughs> discrimination in institutional spheres. And sometimes it's very... Um, in, like in the housing market, it's sometimes difficult to think about who the, it's easy to find the so-called victims, but who are, the, who are the enemies? Who makes something happen? It's often a, uh, what seems like a vague or abstract process that makes this happen. Um, okay, other questions, comments? Um, yeah. I'm sorry to make you repeat yourself. Can I get to that website again? Um, insight, I-N-S-I-G-H-T dot org. I N insight, I N S I G H T dot O R G. Thank you. Yes. Uh, question. Where is there any publicly available space for some of this other data that you share? Um, the interviews that we've done? Yes. Um, not until we have first crack at it. <laughs> um, it's important. Uh, a couple of things are important. Uh, at some point, that data will be publicly accessible. Um, but we, um, be, because we've collected it and spent all the time doing it, and believe me, it's very expensive, it's v incredibly labor intensive, um, we are going to reserve the right for ourselves to take the first crack at the analysis, at the framing of it, um, and, and after a good chunk of what we have to say is in the public sphere, then we'll make the interviews uh, more available all right, at, that, at that level. Um, the other studies, the study that's followed set of families that I only used from 1984 <coughs> to 2009, that's something called the, the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. And you can find that data. That's, that's available on websites. Um, it, it, it takes, you know, a, a little bit of, of, of skills around how, how do you manage and organize data sets, but you can, you know, not easily, but if you have the right people, you can do the exact same kind of work that, that we're able to do. And other people do it. Dan. So I just wanted to try to pick out a couple of points and just make sure I'm getting, getting it for the benefit of everybody else as well as myself. Starting with the opportunity. There are still differences in opportunity, in education, in access mm -hmm. to housing, et cetera, et cetera, which we need mm -hmm. to work on. Mm -hmm. But I gather what you're saying is that even though those differences exist, and even though even in some cases we can reduce the, the differences, for example, education-wise, there has been some reduction in the yes. inequality. Blacks have caught up to whites to some extent educationally, but it still doesn't translate into the ultimate results. And if we try to understand that, part of the reason is because of the history and the extra wealth that white families really accumulate because of not being victims of racism, that black families, for the most part, were not able to accumulate. 
and that's so that's trans. So basically, the gains that are being made in terms of equal opportunity are getting undermined by the inequalities of wealth. Um, in, in a nutshell, yes, um, but not but. I, I want to emphasize at the same time that achievement is really important, and I, and I don't want to undermine that because, in fact, the gains, the, the, the job gains, the income gains, the wealth gains from uh, the difference between a high school degree and a college degree are just are astronomical for everybody. Um, and that's to be encouraged. I could say the same thing about a number of other areas of merit and or achievement. All right. So that's a straight line statement. What complicates it is that the same college degree, the same merit, the same achievement does, still returns differential returns based on, on, on in this instance, race. And, 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 the, and the so other? that's what we want to, yeah. so you want to deal with both, both the opportunity of, in this instance, of, of getting young adults to colleges where they're not left with much, if any, debt. I would add that proviso. Um, and then what, ha what, um, what happens in the labor for force with similar degrees. And the other point I wanted to make and just, there's a big debate going on in this country over what are the reasons for the persistence of racial inequality in economics, right? So you talked about that 54 to 61 percent. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, look, the civil rights law, some people say the civil rights laws were passed. Yeah. There's more okay. equality of opportunity than okay. there was, yet the gap is not reduced. Okay. That means that there's something essentially wrong or deficient about racial minorities because otherwise right. things would have gotten better. And what you're offering is another explanation for what the dynamics would be. It's not because there's some inferiority, but because the way the system works, including right. the right. system of wealth ownership, plays itself out that right. way. Right. Um, okay. So let me um, let me put that in a in a slightly different way. Okay. Um, um, we can. I, I want to treat that theories like that about character differences, about behavioral differences, about cultural differences. Let's treat that as an open sociological historical question and find data. Is there data we could find that help us answer that or is it talk radio? <laughs> or is it talk radio? It doesn't matter what the facts say. So with this piece of data, um, we asked, I asked the question, for example, if we controlled for, that is, if we only looked at successful college educated, middle class, middle class income, married white and black families, everything's equal. The major areas of achievement are equal, right? What should the wealth difference be? The income difference disappears, by the way. What the wealth difference should be negligible. That's not the case. When we look at only the best case successful scenario, the average African American family, that ratio explodes upwards from a dime on a dollar to 25 cents on a dollar. So the achievement is really important. But you've really got to ask. Equal achievement, um, the cult, a lot of the cultural, behavioral stuff, the things around, around marriage, around family, around education have now all been controlled for. The wealth difference is still four to one. So. And, and I know we're out of time. I just want to ask them. So if I cut the military budget with all the, uh, you know, a lot of people don't want us to have a thousand bases overseas guarding Exxon's uh, oil lines, and I so I got 25 percent cut from the military budget. And I'm going to give it to you. Uh -huh. How could you? What policies would you put into effect that could make the wealth gap disappear? I just want to democratize that $400 billion wealth budget. <laughs> um, what policies? Quickly, how about a children's savings bond? How about um, uh, a match, which the proposals are out there. Some states have them. City of, California, uh, City of San Francisco has it. Uh, Pittsburgh's tinkering with it. This is not in the sky or in the head stuff. It's on the ground. It's being worked on. Children's savings accounts um, matched. If the family is lower moderate income, you put money in. The, 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 in San Francisco, it's actually a philip It's a partnership. The city and philanthropic ventures match it. Every kindergartner in, 
in San Francisco as of this year now has a children's savings account. And if that policy continues, by the time they're 18, that's going to make a difference. As long as the state of California doesn't zoom the tuition up and eats it all back mm -hmm. up, that's a different story. That's one example. Okay, in the interest of time, uh, we need to end, but thank you very much, Professor Shapiro. Thank you.